are finally at the seventh lecture. This is the review. It says review. And this is it's laid out in format differently than the rest, so it might not bring everything back to mind, but I think it covers the pertinent points, and I've used a lot of scripture because I wanted to really make sure to see how much of what we've studied so far is drawn from the scripture. So this is our closing presentation on our study of medicine and counseling. We have glanced at the nature and purpose of mankind, why there is suffering, suffering and illness, and various ways of responding to it. We have talked about spirituality, prayer, medicine, stress, psychological terminologies, and the effects of these things in our bodies and in our thinking. Today we are going to summarize what we have discussed about these things throughout the previous six lectures. The format, as you may have already noticed, is going to be a bit different today just because I wanted you all to see how explicitly the scripture addresses the issues we have discussed in this class. Because scripture is sufficient for everything in life and practice, I wanted to primarily set the scriptures before you today. So let us begin at the beginning then. The first catechism question and answer runs thus, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. This is foundational to the rest of what we will say here today. This is the answer to the why that plagues suffering people and those around them. In bodily or spiritual problems, or both, the primary purpose of the believer is the glory of God and rejoicing in Him. The answer to why is always for the glory of God. This is very important in considering why we exist, who we are, the purpose for which we are made, what shall happen to us at death and after, and how we should respond to physical and spiritual sufferings. This premise shall guide what follows, as this premise should never be far from the mind and intentions of the counselor. This is no less so when he is dealing with someone who has physical difficulties as well as spiritual problems. So here are the scriptures on this slide. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. This is the creation of man. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There is a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. They are referencing our bodies, the body and spirit thing. They will see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And that is the glorifying and enjoying God forever part. So here are some foundational principles that we have covered in our study about the nature of man. Men and women are complex beings made up of spirits and bodies. Both the person's heart and his flesh influence his actions. Spirit and body are separable, but only together do they comprise the whole person. The heart is the source of sin, not never the body. Sin is the reason for death and suffering. The body and the spirit of a man have effects on one another. Physical things are not inherently evil, nor are spiritual things inherently good. Weak bodies often allow the true nature of the heart to be revealed, while at other times illness actually hides the true heart. Scripture is the source of understanding these things, not the medical or scientific communities. At the last day, both the unregenerate and believers will be resurrected, their bodies and spirits reunited. Physically, Christians, since we're still assuming that the Christian counselor will not be counseling unbelievers, are body and spirit. Christians are body and spirit. Spiritually, Christians are sinners being renewed. This is not the typical view of the medical community, which sees human beings as merely body or perhaps having some spiritual aspects of as a part of that. Yet, despite the grudging admission of some sort of spirituality, they still consider sin to be merely the result of misuse or abuse of the human body. Thus, because the physical body is not the source of moral volition, they still deny the moral nature of man's actions. This slide, how the heart and flesh influence one another. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. 
A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. We all know what that does. It makes fuming and mess. Because of my loud groanings, my bones cling to my flesh. This again is the, the because of his anguish of soul, his bones cling to his flesh, which is a physical manifestation. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is melted like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. And here's a couple more that didn't make it onto the slide because there wasn't enough room. A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but sorrow but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. What's the address? That's Proverbs 15:13, and Proverbs 12:25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes it glad. And that is, of course, is the anxiety is a spiritual matter, and it weighs him down physically in, in all, of, of, all of life, and a good word makes it glad. Since a human being is a whole person comprised of a body and a spirit, it is pretty clear that these two parts influence one another. Even though the body cannot make someone sin, his body can provide a variety of temptations for him to sin. Additionally, a weak or an ill body often leads to a loosening of the mind's control over the body, laying the path and an inclination to sinning before this person. The heart clearly influences flesh as desire leads to thinking, which leads to feeling, which in turn leads to acting, which leads to a shift in desire oftentimes. So the process repeats. As James says, James 1.15, Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings death. There we see that desire is the source of sin, and sin leads to death ultimately as the consequence. Also, the flesh influences the heart. It goes something like this. Weakness of the body demands a response from the heart. This response can either honor God or rebel against him. Very often, weak bodies allow the true nature of the heart to manifest itself. There are also situations where the body is so sick that its actions are not in line very much at all with the attitudes and desires of the heart. So this is, this is a complex issue, particularly as a counselor, anyways, with anybody, whether it's with yourself or with someone else, to, to be around someone who has this sort of a, a problem this sort of a physical problem, it can be very difficult to tell what is what. And these passages from the Psalms here are very clear. See how a weakness in the body, sometimes even one that originated from a sorrow in the heart, reveals the true heart and desires of the writer. Of course, this is clearer when the whole song is considered in all of these situations. But here we see that the psalmist cry out to God in dependence on him, even in trials of life and limb. Here scripture does not lay before us an example of the body causing someone to sin, but rather an example of the spirit striving to walk in obedience to God even when the body is weak and apparently a hindrance. So we proceed on to the question of why is there suffering, pain, and death in the world? Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Of course, that's speaking primarily to God's people. But still, the principle is the same. He punishes iniquity. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. And this is from Daniel's prayer of confession in Daniel 9. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. So why is there suffering? Why is there pain and death and illness? Why do people hurt? Simply put, suffering is the result of God's just curse on sin. It is the glory of God to punish sin. Whether Adam's sin, Israel's sin, or the sins of the nations, it is for the sake of his holy name that God fulfills his curse upon sin by bringing judgment upon sinners. Humankind was created to have dominion over God's creation in righteousness and holiness. 
When a creature cannot or does not fulfill the purpose of his creation, there is suffering of some sort, physical, spiritual, or both. Sin and death, the curse do to upon sinners, corrupts the purpose of our creation. When we sin, we cannot walk in holiness before our Creator in the realm He has given to us. This brings sufferings to all men, indeed even to the whole creation itself. All creatures die because mankind, in Adam, sinned. The creation suffers because the moral rulers of the earth transgressed against the Creator. For the creation of the moral rulers there being mankind, because we are moral, whereas the creatures aren't, because they're not rational. All creation suffers because the moral rulers of the earth, or sub-rulers we should say, transgressed against their creator. And this is from Romans 8. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that freedom, that the freedom of the glory of the children of God, excuse me, I skipped a line, but he, God subjected, basically God subjected the creation in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Yet, it is also true that not all suffering is a direct result of a personal or a specific sin. Suffering is used by God as a means of sanctifying his children. And here are some more scripture passages. John 9, 3. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. James 1, 2 through 4. Count in all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. These passages are very clear. It is the glory, it is for the glory of God in the sanctification of his saints that they suffer. As Christians are tested, they either, one, show forth more and more the likeness of their master, or two, they dishonor his name. Both of these responses are used of God for his glory and for the further sanctification of his children, even when they respond wrongly. He uses that in their sanctification. Usually, people come to counselors because they are in times of trial and suffering. They may be exhibiting either one of these basic responses, or even both, in different areas of their life. It is the duty of the counselor to help his counseling through such times in a way that is the most honoring to God, a way that is most conducive to God's being glorified in this person. Thus, part of the counselor's task is to help his counseling understand and properly respond to his sufferings as a part of God's good plan, not as retribution for personal sin or unfairness, as or people calling God unfair. Thus, we see that the answer to this second question, why is there suffering, is essentially the same as that of the first. What is the chief end of man? Ultimately, all things are for the glory of God, and it is to the glory of God to work all things out for the good of his saints. Stress, stressors, stressing. Do these terms all mean the same thing? And to Adam he said, that be God. God said to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Here we see the institution of stressors. Stress in life. Trusting in a treacherous man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. That's a particular stressor. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off. 
but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And here the anger and the fretting is stressing. Stress is a fact of life because we live in a fallen, i.e. cursed, world. How we respond to it is a test, a measure, and a means of our sanctification. See how these passages refer to the three different terms? The curse is the cause of stress and unhappy pressures in life. Because Adam sinned, the entire creation was cursed, his means of existence was cursed, his work was cursed, his relationships were cursed, and his very life was cursed. Unhappy pressures in life, illness, strife, and other harmful and threatening things surround us because we live in a fallen world. The treachery in the proverb is a good example of a stressor, a specific pressure on the person. How will you respond to treachery is the question here. There are numerous responses. Will you choose a righteous one or an unrighteous one? By itself, the treachery of a friend, just like a toothache or a fall, is not a matter of sin for you. It is your response to this stressor that is moral. Thus, a stressor could be viewed as a specific temptation. A moral action is a verb. Both stress and stressors are nouns, thus they are not moral wrongs. It is a person's response to these things that is moral, thus it is a person's response of stressing that can be wrong. Because what all that was to say was that the, the treacherous man, okay, maybe that's a sin to him, but to you it's not. How you respond to that will be what's sinful or not. So here's the verb, stressing. Stressing is the one that we hear all the time and we use very frequently. Stressing is usually the fretting, anger, and wrath that we exhibit in response to unhappy things that happen out of our control that we suddenly have to respond to. Stressing is a ubiquitous phenomenon because it is natural. It is natural for us to respond with anger, fear, despair, and fretting to the things that are out of our control. It is part of the war against our yet sinful natures when Christians are taught by the Holy Spirit to respond properly to stressors in life. This is one reason that God continues to send trials and stress upon his children, for when he does so, he hands them a chance to grow up more and more into the image of Christ, which is sanctification. And here we remember that sanctification is one of the reasons for suffering. Just as a note. From a slightly different angle, here is another explanation of these three terms. Stress is the pressure we feel in our spirits, or in our bodies if we're speaking in terms of physics. Stressors are the things, good or bad, that pressure us, requiring a response from us. And stressing is often code language for various manifestations of anger or, and fear, which are clearly moral actions, and often sinful. In summary then, stress is the pressure pushing on us, Stressors are the things themselves that are doing the pushing, and stressing is what leaks out of our natural hearts under that pressure. Here, we're going to shift gears slightly again. Spirituality versus spiritual. I, I kind of use these two terms slightly arbitrarily here for the sake of a point, but perhaps I'll be clear. There's a whole bunch of scriptures here. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. That's just a snippet out of a verse. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 4, 9, continuing the scriptures. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3 Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Hebrews 2, 16 
for surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Mark 16.17-18 and 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. And this is spiritual and physical interactions. All these verses are about spiritual and physical interactions. One more, this is a long passage, Ezekiel thirteen seventeen through 23. And you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own minds. Prophesy against them and say, Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the women who sew magic bands upon all wrists to make veils for the heads of persons of every stature in the hunt for souls. Will you hunt down souls belonging to my people and keep your own souls alive? You have profaned me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, putting to death souls who should not die and keeping alive souls who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to lies. Here, this is false spirituality. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against your magic bands with which you hunt souls like birds, and I will tear them from your arms, and I will let the souls whom you hunt go free, the souls like birds. Your veils I will also tear off and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall no more be in your hand as prey, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Because you have disheartened the righteous falsely, though, although I have not grieved him, and you have encouraged the wicked that he should not turn from his evil way to save his life, therefore you shall no more see false visions or practice divination. I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. As you can see in many of these verses, there are two different basic views of spiritual things. There is a version of spirituality where men and women overemphasize spiritual things just because they are spiritual, usually also underemphasizing God's holiness and their position as his creatures. And then there is the truly spiritual view where men and women consider themselves as whole persons in the world made by the holy God. Now, this is a rather arbitrary distinction of terms, but I bring it up here because spirituality is calm. In our day, and age, spirituality is frequently encountered, but that doesn't mean that it's truly spiritual, as Paul uses the term. So, the spiritual things are holy things, and spirituality are the unholy things, just in an arbitrary manner, as I distinguish the terms. Like many other things in Christianity, keeping a balance between the two errors of over-spiritualizing or over-materializing mankind is necessary to a biblical understanding of things. When there is an overemphasis on one part of the person, whether body or spirit, one's interpretation and understanding of scripture and the commandments of God are thrown out of balance to the degree that one is allowing his presuppositions to be guided by something else. I emphasize this point here because the counselor's own view of the body-spirit relationship has a huge impact on the way he will counsel anyone, particularly anyone with a physical or mental or psychiatric difficulty. The contemporary world often recognizes a spiritual aspect of mankind, even though the evolutionary presuppositions of the medical world do not officially deal with that fact. Because morality is linked to the spiritual nature of man, since it is the spirit that is the source of volition, this denies the medical and the medical view and the evolutionary view, which is one of the same thing, deny the morality of human beings. On the other hand, many contemporary views of spirituality in our culture are not aligned with the true nature of spiritual things revealed in scripture, even though they put great emphasis on man's unseen essential nature. Thus. It is highly important for the counselor to understand both a scriptural view of spiritual things and popular understandings of spirituality with which his counseling is undoubtedly familiar and in whose terms he is probably well versed. So he needs to know the terms of both, both mindsets so that he can get the person to understand or help the person to understand what the scripture actually means when it uses this word that means something else in popular spirituality than it does in biblical spirituality. True spirituality, as Schaefer says. 
describes it. All right, a little bit more scripture. Coping and mental illnesses, both in quotes, as you see. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Take care. Do not turn to iniquity, for this you have chosen rather than affliction. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And here's one more, Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. It was too long to put on the slide. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There are heart and flesh problems where the body and the spirit are not interacting in a normal way due to a physical malfunction. The contemporary world calls these mental illnesses psychiatric disorders or something along those lines. So are these mental illnesses spiritual problems or physical problems? Very often they are both, even though the medical world may tell you that they are primarily or even wholly physical in origin. And then there's also some people who would tell you that they're primarily or only spiritual in origin. Very often they are both. It is undeniable that hard things in life often affect the body as well as the heart. Sometimes the hard thing in life affecting the heart is primarily a malfunctioning or a sick body itself. These verses show us that even when difficult days are upon someone, his heart can still honor God because these trials are sent by him for our sanctification. Also, contemporary mental health care, I should love that term, mental health care experts advocate the idea of coping, in other words, accepting and just putting up with suffering. As Christians, we do not need to just put up with suffering. Of course, we must deal with our problems, but this is not necessarily the same thing that the psychological slash medical world means when it mentions coping. It's a load, loaded term. Rather, scripture shows us that we ought to depend upon God calling out to him. This is necessarily not identical to coping, since coping implies autonomy or at least a spiritual or mental independence from the problem. And just hearkening back to a previous class where coping in the psychological sense means shedding the problem, just basically kind of ignoring it, just like a coping or a stone cap on a wall. I thought that was so interesting that a coping is a stone cap on the wall that sheds water. And so the psychologist took this term and used it, well, that's what you do. When you ignore your problem, just pretend like it's not there. That's how you put up with it. That's just shedding the problem. It's not actually dealing with it, not actually facing it. So that's notice that the Bible doesn't talk about coping. Biblically speaking, dealing with problems or enduring implies dependence upon God and taking dominion of the physical body as much as possible. Even when there is irreparable damage to the body, which happens, the scripture still does not advise coping. It commands endurance. Now, the psychologists use the word endurance, too, but they mean the same thing as what they mean by coping. So, you can be careful with our terms here. They're so minute, the differences, but they make, they make a difference. This, then, is endurance. Endurance carries forward as a child of God, even though things are not going well. It's not ignoring the problem, it's facing it. As Paul said when he was persecuted, he endured. That's 1 Corinthians 4.12. This is what he said to the Corinthians in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. 
but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He will provide you an option that includes obedience, even though that may be the harder way to take. We see then that endurance carries a connotation of knowing, knowledgeably standing fast in one's heart throughout the difficulties. Unlike coping, which tends to technically mean going along with the flow, or even putting up barriers of protective ignorance in one's situation. Because the trials of life are sent for our sanctification, our responses should not be along the lines of coping with the situation as much as they should be in obedience to God in the midst of the situation. Since suffering is sent for our sanctification, endurance is often how we learn obedience, just as the passage in Hebrews said. Therefore, we can see that these two different concepts imply two different views of how we should respond to problems. In self-reliance, in self-shielding, or in reliance, reliance upon God who has promised to be our shield. Remember that we suffer because of sin. These heart-flesh problems are the result of sin. Therefore, to some degree, if the heart is right before God, the problems to be faced in the flesh are less destructive to the person as a whole because he has hope, and not just hopeless submission to fate, chance, or destiny, which oftentimes is what coping means. One is impersonal and essentially meaningless, except for the meaning that you yourself give to it, and that's the, the self-reliance, the self-shielding, the self-coping. And the other is personal and meaningful because of the one who sends it. Now that's very wordy. I hope it was clear, or sort of clear. The mention of coping and mental illness brings up a question that can sometimes be rather touchy. Whose terminology should we use? Psychology hates God and the purpose for which he created us. Should we continue to think in terms defined by our enemies? This is certainly a challenging question, but it is one that needs to be asked, so I'm asking it. Very briefly, let us remember that psychology and the healthcare profession are as spiritual and religious as Christianity simply because they are our human disciplines. With that in view, let us very carefully examine the psychological terms that we use in everyday language and avoid them altogether in counseling whenever their common interpretation does not match up with scripture. Because it's not just what the word technically means, it's how the word is perceived. You must word use words that are perceived with the proper intent that you're trying to convey. On a different note, the most common categories of mental illnesses are developmental disorders, varieties of depression, and a number of anxiety and phobia disorders. Counselors need to know about the psychiatric disorders because they will have to interact with people who have psychiatric diagnoses or psychiatric labels and predetermined ideas about what's wrong with themselves. So a lot of times people come to you and they have these psychological ideas and these diagnoses labels and that's how they interpret themselves. That may not always be accurate, but that's how they think of themselves, and so that's what you have to work with. Counsel yeah. The counselor must parry any of these false ideas, any of these ideas that are humanistic and psychological with the truth of the scriptures and the use of different language where necessary, lest he be misunderstood and misinterpreted by the counselee. Because you might say one thing, and he might hear something totally different. Okay, anger fear, depression. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what they fear nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Again, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you might be tested. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And more. Scripture has a lot to say on these topics. Proverbs 14, 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. 
Proverbs 15, 1 and 18. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he too is, who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 16, 32. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Proverbs 29, 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, we just heard that in Proverbs 15, and one given to anger causes much transgression. 1 John 4, 17 through 19. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Joshua 1, nine, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Jeremiah 8, 18, 20, and 21. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Now we're shifting from anger and fear to depression. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. And there's really not much more than I can add to these scriptures. Sometimes anger is sinful. Sometimes it is good, depending on the object and the motive of the anger. If you have proper fear of God, you will not fear improperly nearly as much. Sometimes excessive or even proper grief can lead to prolonged and undue sorrow. And the body can do the same thing. Sorrow has effects on the flesh, which in turn affects the spirit. Thus, in and of itself, depression is not wrong. Though for a Christian to remain in it, unless it is actually physiological in nature, that is wrong. Let us not forget that manifestations of anger, fear, depression, and even uncontrollable laughter can be caused by the body and may not be accurate depictions of the <coughs> desires and heart of a person. <coughs> Remember what James says, that the desire of the heart is the source of sin? If the true desire of the person's heart is not leading him into the anger, the fear, the sorrow, the uncontrollable laughter, it is not sinful. It might look that way to us who cannot see the heart, but it is frequently possible, especially in cases where other manifestations of physical or psychiatric problems are present. Let us then as counselors be careful neither to assume that flesh or heart is at the basis until we have examined the whole situation. I mean, most particularly as counselors, when, especially if it's someone you don't already know the case. Don't assume. And then, counseling people with heart and flesh problems. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. This is the pattern of counseling people with physical difficulties that affect the heart and mind. Learn about the physiological problem. Distinguish between behavior coming from the heart and behavior coming from the physical malfunction. Address the heart and address the body. We take example from our Lord. He saw the problem distinguish the problems, and then address the heart priorities before addressing the physical priorities. Is this not exactly what he did with the paralytic in this story? 
Having seen the man's bodily malfunction and having distinguished his spiritual needs from his physical needs, he addresses the man's heart before he addresses his body, all in a demonstration that the power of God is alone sufficient for both man's physical and spiritual problems and difficulties. Without him, we can do nothing. So how do we address the heart of a person with heart and flesh disconnect problems? There is rarely a situation where some sort of communication with the person is impossible. There are occasionally situations where there is just is no interaction, no communication, but those are very rare. <coughs> After learning as much if, as you can about the physical problem, you are better equipped to gauge the heart of that person. Speak simply where there is less ability to communicate and to receive <coughs> communication. Speak more complexly where there is more ability and comprehension. Uh, be patient, be very clear, be direct, be loving, be totally honest, and don't mind repeating yourself. The key is to study the person as an individual. Having done this, you can tailor the way that you present the truth to them in such a way as they will be most likely to understand it. And don't forget to remember why you are a counselor, for the glory of God, for the restoration of a brother to usefulness in the church for the edification and love of this child of our Father. In order to do this, you must study the individual. And on that note, we end this part of this class on medicine and counseling. Uh -huh. yeah.